God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Well, maybe not all the time. All right. <laughs> Glad you're here. Uh, we, uh, we, I got to get started right off the bat, so let's just go ahead and crank it up and, and go. <laughs> we got people wanting to go on vacation, and so we got to cook it. We got to cook today. All right. We are uh, in our study of the gospel according to Luke. Uh, we know that. Everybody knows that. But we're, we have moved on. We have actually... <laughs> We're not on verses 12 through 16 any longer. We actually, today, we go to 17. So pull out your iPad, iPhone, iPod. If you have a Bible, that'll work too. Uh, you can read the screens with me. <laughs> but let's get into the Word of God. I want you to make sure you understand my title today. My title is this, Living Like God. Huh, is that possible? Huh. Well, so let's take a look and see, all right? So, remember what's happened now, because let me set this up just a second for you. Jesus, as you recall, <laughs> had gone into the mountain to pray, and he prayed all night. And after he had prayed, he selected 12 apostles, and we've been there for 12 weeks. <laughs> we've been talking about that. We're finally going to get him out of the mountain today. We're going to bring him down into the plain, and he's about to come down and preach this, this sermon that we call the Sermon on the Plain. So this is what's happening. So let's bring him down and let's read. In uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 17, it says this. He went down with them. Now, I want to point out three groups that are in this passage, in this particular section, three groups of people. Them would be the twelve. He went down with them and stood on a level place. In the King James Version, it says plain. A large crowd of disciples was there, or already there. So we have the 12, and then we have another bunch, a large group of people who are disciples that were there as well, and a great number of people. There's another group there from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Now, these had come. Who had come? These came for a specific reason. They weren't disciples. They weren't in the 12, but they were there who had come to hear him, they were curious, what's he going to say, and to be healed of their diseases. This is why they came. They came to get something, if you can understand what I'm talking about. And those troubled by evil spirits were cured. All right. In, in, in every group of people, in every church, in every spiritual gathering, we'll find these three groups. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But Jesus is about to preach this sermon on the plain. But everybody that was there we're not disciples. Now, what I, what I want us to see is, this, let's look at this word disciple right off the bat here. This word disciple, mathetus, means a learner, a pupil, a disciple. What we're talking about here are people that are serious about God. They really want to change. They're not just coming to get something. They're not just going through a hard time and so they're coming to Jesus to fix it. They're not just coming to be healed they're not just coming to be delivered. A disciple is a Christ follower. Somebody who's really serious about their life and really seriously wants to change. In every church and in every spiritual gathering, we always have these three groups. Wherever you go, if I go overseas or to another church to preach, it's always the same. You have them. People that are specifically called to do something specific. It can be ministry. It can be going into overseas missionary work, or it can be children's ministry, or, or becoming an elder, you know, what they're, but they're called my God, it's to them. And then there are the disciples, there are the people that are so serious about God, they really want to change, they want to please God, they, they want to follow Him, they want to learn, they, they, they want to take what they've learned and, and make that applicable and apply that to their lives. But then there's always the others, or those that are passing through, and once they get what they want, they're gone. They, they get satisfied at whatever they're going through, uh, it, it, it works out, so they're gone, or, or maybe they're there to avoid uh, hell, make sure they get to heaven, but once they're satisfied that they're there, uh, they're gone. Uh, so we have this other group that are always present. I want to ask you, because I think it's so relevant for you and for me to know, 
if you yourself positioned yourself, placed yourself into one of those three groups, into which group would you honestly place yourself? Are you a them? You come and you really want to do something specific and special for God? Are you a disciple? You really want your life to change? Or are you just passing through? And, and it's so important that you answer that honestly. Because in this sermon on in the plain, what Jesus is going to do is make us look and see if we're real or if we're just playing the church game. Are, are we deceived? And this is what this sermon is about. And to what group do I best fit? Crowds uh, continued to come, grow and grow and grow as they came to hear about this increasingly famous man called Jesus. And I want to look at a map, <clears throat> kind of get you around it and understand how this is going to uh, works out in the natural and then make this applicable. Where Jesus is ministering right, is right around here is around the Sea of Galilee. Here's Capernaum right here. This is kind of his headquarters. And this is the majority of where Jesus specifically ministers. But what we read in that passage is that people were coming from all over. They were coming from way down south down here in, in Judea area. See, this is Judea area down here. Here down here is Jerusalem. So they were coming from 100 miles away is Jerusalem. South Judea would have been maybe 120. North Judea maybe 80. And it also said that they came from Tyre and Sidon. Sidon is the very top of that map. And they were coming over here, coming down here to, 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 to where Jesus is as well. So people were coming. What Luke wants us to see is from the south and from the north. They were, they were coming from everywhere to, to see Jesus, to hear him, to be healed, to learn, to be disciples, to all these groups of people. Now, what I wanna, want us to see is this is pretty phenomenal and intense when you think about it. Because the mode of travel in those days was walking or animal, Correct. And so if you're coming from 120 miles away and you're walking, you're talking with children especially, you're talking a week or two of traveling, walking, serious, hard-pressing walking. Uh, you, if you're coming from Tyre and Sidon, you're, you're, you're walking 40 or 50 miles away, you know, and, you, and this is a ways to go. And the weather always wasn't 70 degrees and clear. It was rain. It would be hot. It would be cold. And so these people were coming. There were no McDonald's, no subways. <laughs> Along the way, no women's rooms, men's rooms, no nurseries provided. And so these people were coming. And once they found Jesus, and they had to find out where he was, and once they did, then they had to live outside or out under the stars. There were no hotels, motels, no super eights. They were, they were there. And so it's pretty intense when you really realize that all these people were pressing like this to go and see Jesus. Would you do that? Would you do I want to answer it for you and then I'll work with it because yes most of you would you do in fact you do it every week and, and, I'll, and I'll work there let me read this next verse to us it's in verse 19 of Luke 6 it says and the people all tried to touch him because power dunamis miraculous power was coming from him and healing them all Jesus is going to minister to whoever, whoever comes whether you're just passing through or whether you're really serious. But, but, but who he wants us to really be is a disciple. And so these people were coming. He was the personality of the day. He was the superstar. He was the phenom. And people were coming. They wanted to see Jesus, meet Jesus, hear Jesus, touch Jesus, for Jesus to touch them. And when, he, when they did come, something would happen in their lives. He's just This power, this, this, this something was coming out of him that was supernatural. And it would touch their lives. Now... Make all of this sort of relevant to us. Why are you here today? Why did you come to church today? Why did uh, some of you even lay your clothes out last night? Judah lays my clothes out every... <laughs> uh, why do you get up, take a bath, hopefully, or maybe you took one last night, but, but why, why did you do that? Why did, uh, you know, some of you have ch little children and, and, and you, you, you got to go through all of this just to load them in the car and that sometimes becomes a pretty good job. And you drive, some of you drive 20, 30 miles one way, and some of you maybe even way, way further than that. And you come and you, you do this week in, week out. You do it in the heat and the snow and the rain, cold. You come. Now, why do you do that? Let me tell you why. Because inside of you, inside of me, is this inherent, inert part 
wired into us that we want to know God. We're hungry. We're hungry for God. And, and we'll do it. And it's pretty intense. That's pretty phenomenal, right? Don't, don't you think? People, we do that every week, most of us. Every week. But take that and multiply that by every, every church in our, in our areas having the same thing. People are coming. Um, then take that even more phenomenally and multiply that by every church in every city around this globe. People are coming to see Jesus, hear Jesus, touch Jesus, Jesus touch them. For whatever reason, they're coming. But here's what I want to bring it to. How many of those billions, and there are billions that are doing it right now, how many of those billions are truly disciples? How many of those billions are them? They're doing something specific for God. How many of those billions, though, are just passing through? Just coming to get what they can, make sure they avoid hell, get to heaven? How many of those billions are just going through a hard time right now and they're hoping God can help them? Where are we? Because you see, this Sermon on the Mount, excuse me, this Sermon on the Plain that we're about to look at for the next couple of weeks, what Jesus is going to do, and here's the intense part of this, is Jesus is going to challenge us to see if we're real. Are we real? Or are we only playing some church game, some spiritual game? Are we deceived? Do I think I'm okay? Do I think I'm going to make it to heaven? Or, or am I just totally fooled? And what the Sermon on the Plain does is Jesus makes it clear this is for disciples. This is for people that are serious, serious about God. Show you. Next verse. Luke chapter 6, verse 20 says this. Looking at his... You got you to see it. I only got about four or five people to respond then. Everybody say it. Looking at his disciples. disciples. He said, blessed are you who? So I, I'm going I'm to read the rest of it, but I just want to make sure you see his focus, his intent, are disciples. People who want to learn. People who want to change. And what this Sermon on the Plain is about is about people that want to. To decide if I'm really real or if I am just deceived. So, let's read this passage now. Now, now I want you to, to pay attention. Because <laughs> this is a hard saying. This is a difficult passage, okay? Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor. Now, he's not saying poor in spirit. That's not, that's not in there, is it? Blessed are you who are poor. He's not talking about being poor in spirit. He's talking about financially poor. Blessed are you who are poor. <laughs> For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who, are hung who hunger now. He's not talking about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. That's not what it says, is it? It says, blessed are you who hunger now. He's talking about not being well fed. For you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now. <laughs> for you're, you'll laugh. <laughs> blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. And don't only, don't only realize that you're blessed, but be happy about it. Re rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how the, their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, who are wealthy. See, he wasn't talking about being poor in spirit. He's talking about being poor. For you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed. <laughs> he wasn't talking about, you know, hungry and thirsting for righteousness. He's talking about food. For you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh a lot now. <laughs> yeah, a lot's not in there. I put that. <laughs> Wo woe to you who laugh now. For you will mourn and weep. Woe to you. 
when all men speak well of you. For that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. Do what? Now, if I read that correctly, and this is not a trick question. Does Jesus want me poor? Does Jesus want me hungry? Does Jesus want me crying and weeping? Does Jesus want people to say I'm evil? That's not a trick question. Is that how it read to you? That's how it read to me. No, Jesus wants me blessed. <laughs> well, no, but that's not what I call blessed. <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not what I consider being blessed. Poor and hungry and weeping and crying and being rejected and talked about and people saying you're evil. That doesn't sound like a blessing. In fact, it seems like 180 degrees opposite of what I think is blessed. And you're exactly right. You're it. You're, you're, you're on it. Because Jesus takes the things of the world and he turns them completely upside down. <laughs> 180 degrees. Yeah. Uh, you can imagine, you see, when, 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 you're, when you're just preaching anything you want to preach, you don't preach from here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right? <laughs> but when you do what we're doing and going through the book of Luke, uh, paragraph by paragraph or sometimes word by word, when, 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 when you do that, you, you don't get to skip this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can help us, because if I can, it's going to change our lives. Many theologians say that uh, this is the same sermon that Matthew talked about in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. That's called the Sermon on the Mount. I say it's not. I don't think it is. And there are several reasons. Uh, the theologians are obviously not preachers. <laughs> they just write their theology, you know, and spread that around. But see, when you're a preacher, and especially an itinerant preacher, much like Jesus was, at that time, then you're maybe preaching in Capernaum today in the synagogue, but tomorrow you're on the mount. And maybe the next day you're down in the plain preaching. And maybe the next day you're in another town uh, preaching in their synagogue and, and, you're, and you're, you're, uh, you're moving around. Now, the message doesn't change. You don't write a new message every time you, you, you preach. And especially when the message is the kingdom of God and the gospel, it's going to be similar when I would go to, to Trinidad, uh, Barbados, when I would go to, uh, to those places in Haiti and, and preach, when I would go there, I would preach basically the same thing every place I went. I would come at it from a different slant, a different angle, but, but it was pretty much the same thing. And so there are similarities between the two sermons, but there are tremendous differences. And so it's these differences that we just read that makes you go, whoa, oh, what is that? But one of the main things that I, I don't believe that it's the, the same sermon is because when Matthew wrote it, it wrote it, he wrote it at the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ. He hadn't selected his apostles yet. Uh, he, he's just preaching it right now and then later on. Well, right in this, when Luke writes this sermon, then what he's telling us is Jesus is about a year into the ministry. He selected his apostles and now, and now he's coming down. But it, that's all irrelevant. So chronologically it's different, but, but all of that's irrelevant. We're here. And, and I got to... I got to teach this. <laughs> and you got to get it. So, and if I'm successful, if I can articulate this, exegete this, if, if I can communicate this correctly, we will all be blessed. If we take what we hear and learn and make that applicable into our life. So, let's try to get working. First thing I've got to get you to see <laughs> is the different styles that are included into this sermon and into this passage that we've just read. Jesus used several different teaching styles. We all are aware that he used parables, right? We all know what a parable is, or we think we do. But what a parable is, in case you don't, is a story. It's not true. But it's taken from true events. It could be taken from things that actually happen. But it's formulated into a story so that we can draw truth from that story and learn a biblical truth, a truth about life, from a parable. That's what a parable is. It's not a true story. It's just made into a story so that we can learn something from it, taken from life events. Now, another thing that Jesus used, and he uses it here, and you've heard me mention this in a couple of weeks ago, but he also uses hyperboles. Now, I'm gonna, I'm, I know we haven't been to school, some of us, in a while, and, and 
don't know exactly what I mean here. So I'm going, to, I'm going to help us get this because if we don't understand hyperboles and another thing that we're going to be talking about today is parallelisms and we don't understand these things and how they work into understanding the Bible and interpreting difficult passages like this, then we'll never get it. And it's like you just read it. Well, I don't understand that. And you just keep on reading and you don't get anything from it. But I want us to get from this because this is, this is crucial. So I want us to look at the word hyperbole. Put that up there for me. And hyperbole is an intentional, obvious exaggeration. An intentional, obvious exaggeration to create emphasis or effect. It's used to evoke strong feelings or to create a strong impression to help the hearer remember. But not meant to be taken Literally, now leave that up there, leave that up there, just a second. In other words, Jesus isn't stretching the truth, as sometimes we do. <laughs> you, you with me? This is obvious, obviously not true. This is what an hyperbole is. You can't take everything Jesus said literally. Now, I know that sounds blasphemous, but I'm going to make it clear here in just a second. Okay, you can take it down. It's an obvious stretching of the truth. You and I use hyperboles all the time. All the time. For example, that bag weighed a ton. Did it really? <laughs> How were you making an obvious exaggeration? Oh, were you just lying? Now everybody knows that bag didn't weigh a ton. All right, how about another one? I am freezing to. <laughs> Are you really? Or I am burning. And we men hear that a lot, right? <laughs> uh, 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 let's do another one. Let's do another one. <laughs> it took us forever to get there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> forever? See, those are obvious exaggerations that we, we use in life to make a point. The bag didn't really weigh a ton. But it was heavy. And somebody was saying, help me carry this thing. It weighs a ton. And they're, they're making a point. You know, they're, 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 they're wanting you to feel what they're feeling. And so, and so uh, go, going on, you're really not freezing to death. You're cold. Does the heat work? And I see some of you asking that back there right now. <laughs> so why don't we do something about that? We do have some heat in here. Let's kick it up a little bit. So, but, but, but you know, I'm, you're, not, oh, you're not burning up. You know, that's obviously hot. Uh, do we have air? You know, uh, yeah, it, it's a long ways. It took a long time to get there, but it didn't take forever. <laughs> See, you're, you're obviously exaggerating to express your feelings. So you'll get the point and remember it. <laughs> remember. Now, Jesus used hyperboles all the time, all the time in, in his teachings. And if, and if you don't understand that, you're going to be cutting off your hands and plucking out your eyes. You with me? Okay. <laughs> All right, now I'll read that in just a second. Just it fitted, so I, I fitted it. <laughs> Luke 18, 25, one of, the, one of the hyperboles of Jesus. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, you may have heard a, a preacher talk about how, how there was this camel gate or this eye of the needle gate that was in Jerusalem. That's not true. I researched it. There never was, never will be a needle gate or a camel gate <laughs> in Jerusalem. Uh, some preacher came up with that just to make an interpretation, his interpretation work. It's not true. So what's Jesus doing? He's obviously exaggerating that it is impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And it's even more difficult for a greedy, wealthy, rich person to get into the kingdom of God. You remember that? Let's look at another one. Luke 14, 26. We'll get to these one year. <laughs> if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yea, even his own life, watch now, he cannot be my disciple. Does Jesus want us to hate our spouses and our children and, and, and our mothers and our dads and, 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 and our Friends, even ourselves? No, because what he said was, I want you to love people. I want you to love them even when they hate you. I want you to love people. He said, I want you to love your brother even as you love yourself. So you love yourself. 
So that's not what he's saying. This is a hyperbole. What is Jesus saying? The point that he's making is this, is that if you listen to anybody else above me, if you follow anybody else above me, what they're saying and what they're telling you to do above me, whether it be your spouse, whether it be your mother, your daddy, whether it be your children, whether it be your best of friends, even yourself, if you listen to that before you listen to me, you're not my disciple. Let's look at another one. Luke 6, 41. <laughs> Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Now, the plank word, the word plank here is beam. It, it, that's what it means. It's the major beam in a structure. It, you, you couldn't live with much less function, right? I mean, it's a hyperbole. And it's, this one is actually in this sermon that we're going to be studying. What, what's, what's his emphasis here? Judge not. That you be not judged. If you got enough stuck in your head already, Matthew, 20, Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Throw it away. <laughs> it's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of the body than for your whole body to go into hell. All right, let's get a line. Come on. Let's get the saws and the... Eye pluckers and <laughs> you can't take everything Jesus said literally. You got to know what he's doing. It's an obvious exaggeration that everybody knows or hopes they know <laughs> that this is an hyperbole. He's exaggerating to make a point that you remember. What's his point here? Do anything to avoid hell. Cut off anything in your life that's taken you to hell. <laughs> you want your eyes on <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so this is what he's doing here. And in this passage that I just read, he used four hyperboles. He, he, he said, blessed are you who are poor. That's an exaggeration. Is God poor? Blessed are you who are hunger, who hunger. Blessed are you who weep. Blessed are you who hate. See, See, what he's doing is this, is this is his introduction to a sermon. And it's to create interest. How many think that he got their, their interest? When, when I read this and I realized I had to preach this, it got my interest. And it should get all of our interest. What in the world is he talking about? I thought God said, I'll give you the power to make wealth. Did he not? Deuteronomy 8.18? Well, then why do you want me poor if you're going to make, give me the ability to be prosperous? I thought that Pastor Steve Lytle preached the other week that, that, that a merry heart does good like a medicine. Right. Well, then why does he want me crying and saying? Doesn't make sense to me. I thought it was a blessed time when there were figs on the vine and grapes on the vine. And I thought there was a blessed time when the calves were in the stall and things were prosperous. I thought that's what the Bible taught. What is this stuff? What's this talking about? And I know that he's using hyperboles. Here's how I know. When is poor, poor enough? See, by the world's standards and averages, I am a wealthy man. In fact, people that are on the poverty list in America are wealthy by the world's standards. So when am I poor enough to get into the kingdom of God? So Jesus is doing something here. All right, let's do another one. When, he says, let's do the poor, let's do the hungry. When am I hungry enough? When, when, am, when am I hungry enough to, to be full and blessed? <laughs> when, when is that enough? When am I, when am I crying and weeping enough? When, when, when am I sad enough that God will bless me in heaven? When am I talked about enough? When am I called evil enough? When am I rejected enough? When does that happen? So that I know I'm in. <laughs> it's hyperboles. He's exaggerating to make a point. Now, along with that, <laughs> along with this, that is parallelisms. 
And you got to be able to understand this, to put it together so you'll get it. Parallelisms. Now, to say that Jesus didn't think logically is kind of an understatement, don't you think? He didn't think like most folks think. In fact, the way Jesus thought is basically 180 degrees opposite. Are, are you with me? Do you think so? <laughs> A lot of times he's totally opposite from how most folks think. And that is a parallelism. That's what a parallelism is. It's 180 degree opposite. See, let's say Jesus is farsighted. Now, I don't mean he needed glasses so he can read. But he sees farther than we see. <laughs> and what Jesus sees is this, that something we think is a blessing today is a woe down the road of life. He sees that the things that we applaud and want and desire and, and call blessings today farther down the road of life will actually woe us away from God, away from the kingdom of God, and if not cautious, into the kingdom of darkness and eventually to hell. He sees that. And unless we understand that, we could end up woed and not blessed. And so he gives us these parallelisms. And let me, let me show you them. What they do is they, instead of causing us to seek after God, they take us away from God. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me show you the four that he gives here. Put those up for me, please. Uh, in uh, Luke 6, 20, it says this. Blessed are you who are poor. All right, now, that's the hyperbole, the exaggeration. Here is the parallel. But woe to you who are rich. He says that in verse 24. Now, let me, let me work on that just a second. You can either leave it up or take it down. It doesn't matter. But, okay, let, let's, let's think about this. See? I have seen, you have seen people who want a job and they want it desperately. And when they get this job, it's a blessing. But then they become very prosperous. And they get some money. And in fact, sometimes this job keeps them away from church on Sundays and keeps them away from their families and puts them in a position to get into trouble, takes them out of town, takes them into places they shouldn't be, doing things they shouldn't do. And though it was a blessing and applauded at the moment, now it's a woe to them. And I've seen people come into some money, and it's more difficult for them to get into the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. Let's look at the next one. Verse 21. Blessed are you who hunger now. And then he says, but that, and that's the, that's the hyperbole. But woe to you who are well, who are well fed now. Okay, let's just take the literal aspects of that. Hunger, okay, um, it's, it's good to have food. It's good to eat. But how many know we can eat too much? We can bring a woe on our own bodies. Blood pressure problems, sugar diabetes, knee problems, heart problems. But other than just that, Whenever I'm hungry for something and I get myself full of it, it's the same principle. It's damaging to me because I no longer need God. I'm no longer hungering for God. I'm hungering for something else. And it becomes a woe. Let's look at the next one. Blessed are you who weep now. That's the hyperbole. Woe to you who laugh now. I mean, that there are some things in life that you just need to take very seriously. And if you laugh about the things and you just kind of ha 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 over the things in life that we need to get dead serious about, how I many know it brings a woe? See, there are some things we just don't want to deal with in our own lives. We just kind of laugh over it, forget about it, act like it's not there. But Jesus sees that down the road, that's a woe. That's the parallel. Next one. Blessed are you when men hate you. That's the hyperbole. Woe to you when men speak well of you. That's the parallel. Uh, 
When I'm more concerned about your applauds, and I'm more concerned about, about tickling your ears than the applause of God, I'm, I'm in woe. <laughs> And, 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 and nobody enjoys a compliment. I enjoy the cards, the emails, the things you guys send me, the phone calls you make to me. I enjoy all that as much as anyone. But if I get up here and I can't preach a sermon that I feel like God wants me to preach because I don't want to hurt you or, or I feel like, you know, you'll get mad at me. Woe to me. So... One more thing I want us to see here before I move on to this. Put, put, that, put that last slide back up for me, please, because I want to make a point. I want us to see that in every blessing has a parallel and a corresponding woe. Everything in life is this way. Everything that can be a blessing can become a woe. And Jesus wants us to see this. Everything. A relationship. Everything. A job. Even honey? Honey? Yeah. In fact, that's when I chose to, to emphasize this just to, to show us. Honey has a parallel. Whoa. <laughs> I like honey. Don't you? I like honey mixed with peanut butter, put on a piece of bread. Oh, my goodness, that is so good, so sweet, so good. Let's eat too much of it. Proverbs 25, 16. If you find honey, eat just enough. <laughs> All right? There you, there's the... Now the parallel. Too much of it, <laughs> and you will vomit. Even honey, the simplest things in life, have this parallel woe. Everything does. Now, Proverbs is a book of parallels. And that's what it, it's, every proverb nearly is a parallel. Do this, and, uh, and, 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 or do this. You know, it's, it's that kind of parallel. But is Proverbs really teaching us here about honey? Is, is, that what, is that what that verse is really telling us? Don't eat too much honey, Terry. Is, is that what it's really teaching? No, honey is a blessing in life. It's symbolic of a sweet blessing in God, from God in life. But if you eat too much of it, it's a woe. And it'll bring bad stuff into your life. Even honey has a corresponding and parallel woe. And so let's make that applicable. Let's make this, let's hook this up. If, if I overeat the sweet blessing of prosperity, woe to me. Because it'll take me out of the kingdom of God. I'll be greedy. If I, if I eat too much of or, or overeat, overeating <laughs> food, woe to me. And that's for everything in life. Whatever that I'm hungry for. A boat. How many believe that if I were to allow it, my boat could take me out of the kingdom of God? <laughs> Judy's got... <laughs> See? Well, everything. A car. People. Everything. Whatever you're hungering for. Whatever your honey is. <laughs> Who's your honey? <laughs> it can take you out. I mean, okay, let's move on. <laughs> Why not? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, like, uh, laughing. Uh, if, we, if we take life too lightly, we overeat of not getting serious about the, the, the things in life that we really need to deal with. There's a woe coming. And, the, and, 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 and you know, for, for the things of God, if I, want the, if I overeat the applause of people and, and I'm more serious about making you happy and being, preaching what you want to hear, than I am about the applause of God. It's, it's sweet to get your, 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 your applause. It really is. I, I, it means I've, I've done something that said something to you. But if that's all I'm after, if I overeat on that, I won't be a good preacher. So Proverbs, in fact, what, what these things will do to us is they'll make us sick of God. Let me read this to you, Proverbs 27, 7. He who is full loathes honey. But to the hungry, parallel, even what is bitter tastes sweet. See, when you're full of whatever your honey is, <laughs> we stop being hungry for God. Our appetites have been refocused. And we stop being hungry for God. In fact, we loathe God. We loathe going to church.
Uh, we loathe praise and worship. Raise your hands and praise God. Who do you think he is? It makes me sick when he says that. I hate it when he preaches that. Makes me sick. <laughs> Talk about giving. See, we, we start loathing the, 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 the coming to church. We start loathing worshiping God. We start loathing the preaching of the word of God. And when something is said about giving, oh my goodness. He makes me sick. That's all he ever talks about. I might have only talked about it once or twice the whole year. But you see, you're already loathing the honey. We loathe giving. We loathe relationships. We loathe praying. We, we loathe studying the word. We loathe ministering to people. Why? Because we're full of other things. Until a bitter time comes. <laughs> And then we get hungry for God again. So let's take a look at the words blessed and woe. And I'll try to bring this thing to a conclusion as quickly as I can here. I knew it was going to be a little bit lengthy, but it's so good. Okay, let's look at this. Blessed is, is the word makarios. And it, what it means, and this is where I really want us to see something here, meaning blessed, happy, happier. Now here is the emphasis that I want us to see today. It's used to express the happy and uncontrolled life of the gods. Now, now that's heavy. Now, this is deep. So when Jesus says, blessed are you, he's saying, you can have the life of gods. You can have a happy life, an untroubled life, are you? And then the word woe, Great word, just a great word. I love this word. O-I-E. <laughs> and it means an explanation of grief. <laughs> let, me, let me give you just a little word picture here. O-I-E. It's like you're barefooted and you're walking on gravel. Oh, ah, e, oh, ah. Or walking through a briar patch. Oh, 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 ah. And you can't move forward and every time you try to, you, you oh, ah, e, e. And, and, and life is that way. It's a life of grief as you're trying to walk through life. Life of woe. O-I-E. So, what Jesus is, is doing here, and this is oh, so much what I want us to get today, and so I've put it on the screen so that we'll be able to not only hear me say it, but read it. A blessed life is a life God has and enjoys. A woe life is a life everyone else endures. Is Jesus really saying, I can live like God? See, Jesus is teaching us the very best life possible. We could live like gods. Is that blasphemy or is that scriptural? What do you think? <laughs> well, let me show you. Psalms 82.6. I said, this is God, God said, I said, you are gods. You are gods. I said it. I said, you are gods. You are the sons of the Most High. The sons of what? So we have no trouble understanding that a king's kids live like kings. They live in the king's palace. They eat the king's food. They have the king's money. They live like kings. But yet we can't get our heads wrapped around that we are the children of the Most High. But yet we live like the devil. Am I right? Can you hear that? See, we should be living like gods. If we are the sons of God, we should be living in his kingdom, living under his rule, under his ways, having his money, his food. <laughs> Jesus uh, used this exact verse. Jesus did it. They were getting after him about saying that he's the son of God. In John 10, 34, it says this. Jesus answered them, them here are the Jews. They're blaspheming. Is it not written in your law, in your Bible, in your word? Is this not written there in your law? Have you, have, 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 um, I have said, you are gods? Is that not in your word, in your Bible, in your scriptures? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, see that's the difference when the word of God comes. And the scripture cannot be broken. In other words, if, this, if the Bible's really true, 
What about the one whom the Father set apart? Listen, what Jesus is saying is, is the word itself says that you are God, so why are you having such a difficult time with me saying that I'm the Son of God? Why do we have such a difficult time with that? Blessed are you, like God are you, living like God are you. The life that I want to show you and give you and let you understand is a life like God. The blessed life is a God-like life. It's how Jesus lived, right? Jesus gives us this parallelism, and it's something that we quote, we hear it all the time, and I want us to see it, and, and it's in John chapter 10 and verse 10. This is the King James Version, which is the one we quote the, the most frequently. The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's the colon. That, it says, okay, that's, this is the parallel here. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. 180 degree opposite. That's the parallel. Jesus comes to give us a, a God-like life, an abundant life, the best life we can possibly have. In the New Living Translation, I'll read it to you from, from it, the same verse. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and to destroy. Parallel, my purpose is to give you life in all its fullness. What, what's he saying? Is that we can, we can live under the directions of the devil, under the thief. We can live under the, say, right, we can live under the, under the directions of the thief, or we can live under the directions of Jesus and have a God-like life. A life to its full. A life that's not full of O-I-E. In our passage today, in the remainder of this, of this sermon, Jesus is preaching about enjoying a blessed God-like life. This is what he's preaching about. And it's paralleled with living a life of grief. A life of O-I-E. So, here to me, and I want to give you this, here to me is the theme and the point of the entire sermon and what we'll be talking about for the next few weeks. Here it is. Put it up on the screen for me. If you are real, a real disciple, this is the life you live. It's not a suggested life. If you're real, this is how you live. Luke 6.20, we've already read it, looking at it one more time, looking at his disciples, he said. Blessed are you who? Looking at his disciples. This is focused for people that really are serious about God. And if you're not really serious about God, you're not a disciple, and you're not real. You're deceived, you're playing church. You may think you're going to heaven, but you better be start doing some Cutting off of hands, it's a plucking out of eyes. So, this is what he's after. So, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to wind it up now. So, this sermon instructs us, if you're real, how you live. And it's not suggested. This is not suggested. He never says, if you want to be like this. <laughs> he says, this is what my disciples do. Here's how you live. You can know if I'm real. By the fruit of my life. You can look at my life and tell, am I making good fruit or am I making rotten fruit? What am I producing? You can know if I am real. Not only if I forgive my enemies, but if I love my enemies. If I love them and look for ways to bless them. That's what you do if you're real. You can know if I'm real because I refuse to talk about people. I refuse to put people down because I judge not that I be not judged. That's what you do if you're real. If you're real, you give generously. If you're real, you, you give. You're not greedy. You give people to, to people and you don't expect anything back. If you're real, if you're real, you do not retaliate. You take the lick and you turn the cheek. If you're real, if you're real, you don't say just, Lord, Lord. You do what he says do. I'll read you that one in just a second as we close. If you're real, you can look at my life and know I'm real. You can look at my life and see that I've dug down deep. 
And that I found the rock, the rock Christ Jesus, and you can look at that and you can understand that I am real. How do we know that, Delbert? Because I've laid that foundation and when the torrents of life, when the, when the tumultuous storms of life come, I'm still standing after it's hit me. I'm not even hardly shaken. I'm still there. You can know if somebody's real. You can know if you're real. You see, I, I see all these billions of people going to church, but how many are real? How many are deceived just playing church? And so what Jesus wants to teach us in this, in this Sermon on the Plain is he wants us to look at our own lives and decide, am I real? Or am I just deceived? Luke 6, 20 says this, looking at his disciples, he says, no, that's not what I want, wrong one. Where's my last verse? That's it, good enough. Anyway, I wanted to read the one where he said, never mind, it's enough. See, what I want us to see in this Sermon on the Mount over the next couple of weeks, are you real? In which group do you place yourself? In which group are you? Are, are you really one of them? called to do something special with God. Are you, are you a disciple? Somebody who really is serious about the things of God. Want to change. Want to have a good life. A blessed life. A life like God lives. Or are you just passing through? Are you just here to get what you can? Maybe God gets you out of trouble. Out of a situation. Keep you from going to hell. Woe to you. Woe to you. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we did it. <laughs> I, uh, I pray, Lord, that we've challenged each one as I've challenged, as I've been challenged this week as I've studied. Lord, I ask you to bless us. Lord, I pray that each of us are just real. Lord, I really pray that people, as we study this, learn how to be a disciple, but not only be, Realize it's not optional, but realize that we're, we're here for a reason. We're in the gathering to be changed. Your eyes closed, your heads bowed. What the Lord really wants to do right now, is, as I'm done, is just challenge us with this particular thought. I'm trying to phrase it. How many want to know you're real? That you're, you're where you need to be in God and that you're really going where you think you're going? How many, how many want to know that? If that's you, just slip your hand up and say, I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I'm okay. Yeah, all right. Well, then this is for you. You cannot afford to miss. You got to hear this. 